We're a nonprofit organization dedicated to eradicating human slavery, human trafficking, child exploitation, and child sexual abuse material through disrupting networks and applying data, technology, and advanced analytics and intelligence. All right, welcome to this session. I'm Wes Lyons, general partner at the Eagle Freedom Fund, where we invest in technology companies that are purpose built to combat human trafficking. We have uh, four brilliant founders with us this morning. Super excited for each of you being with us. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks I'll tell you for a us. moment who, who we've got with us here today. We've got David Nicolini from Evidensity. They are leaders in helping companies see what they can't see, looking into their supply chains so their supply chains can become ethical and resilient. David, thank you for being with us uh, this thank morning. Thanks, Wes. Honored to be with all of you. Yeah. We also have Rochelle Starr. She leads Freedom Signal. It's a nonprofit tech platform that texts sex workers in mass to offer them help. And we're going to get to unpack with her a little bit this morning um, the data and scalable solutions that she's bringing to the fight. Rochelle, it's an honor to have you with us today. Thanks. We also have Noel Thomas, founder of Darkwatch, an AI platform that's helping banks, hotels, and actually other industries as well stop their businesses from being used by traffickers. Noel, it's exciting to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us, Wes. Yeah. And last but not least, Johnny from Deja Vu, um, pattern recognition software company that's already being used for live rescues to help law enforcement to find trafficking victims. Johnny, so thankful you're with us. Thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. Before we dive into each of these amazing entrepreneur stories, I just want to share the answers to the two questions that almost everybody asks when they hear the words for-profit and counter-trafficking used in the same sentence. The first is, why is for-profit a part of this conversation? And the second is, how are people making money in this? Um, first, why for-profit? Um, I know for us, as we wrestled with what our part to play is in combating human trafficking, we really were smacked in the face by the sheer scale of the problem. Um, the the number of trafficking victims at 50 million globally is staggering. The speed with which it's growing is is staggering. We've added more than 10 million victims since before COVID to, to post COVID. And the scale of the dollars that are moving in selling people is has become just incredible, approaching a quarter trillion per year. And we came to a deep conviction at Eagle that we needed to build billion dollar enterprises that could enter the ring in a a toe-to-toe -to -toe fashion with multi-billion dollar crime syndicates um, because it's just, uh, I heard uh, a leader in the industry talking about it's it's like putting um, somebody in a horse race against a Ferrari sometimes is what it can feel like when multi-billion dollar crime syndicates are running against um, kind of underfunded nonprofits. Um, and that's not a case that nonprofits um, are are not valuable in the fight or aren't, um, aren't doing incredible work. Uh, we have uh, an incredible nonprofit on the panel today. It's just that um, kind of capitalism and for-profit needs to step in and do our part, if that makes sense. Um, and the, the second question that always comes up once people kind of realize that this isn't philanthropy that we're talking about um, is how on earth do you might make money fighting trafficking? And the um, there's we've identified the $3 billion markets that we're building into. I'll dive into two of them briefly so you can understand the markets that the, these entrepreneurs are playing into. The first is the, is the regulatory pressures and um, Evidensity is a great example of a company building into regulatory pressure where 
Um, there are more and more regula regulations coming out across the globe that are pressuring companies to look into their supply chain and eliminate trafficking, um, especially labor trafficking. One great example of this is in January, the EU corporate directive came out that said every com large company working in Europe needed to look into their supply chain and find and eliminate slavery. And it was the most, it, kind of the most teeth that we had ever seen in a regulatory um, action because they put 5% of global revenue at risk for a company working in, um, in Europe. Massive teeth. Also, similar um, legislation in Canada, in the US, in Australia, in Germany. Just kind of globally, we're seeing this groundswell, which turns into a hurricane force tailwinds for the companies that are bringing um, transparency to help companies uh, answer that direct pressure. Um, so that's a great example. We'll dive into a little bit an example of that with uh, with Evidensity. The second is the corporate lit the um, litigation victories. JP Morgan just had uh, to pay out of settle out of court for $290 million for being the bank to Jeffrey Epstein's sex ring, directly touching Noel and the work that he's doing. There are 40 hotel brands in court um, directly on not addressing human trafficking that's happening inside of their hotels. The first one settled out of court for $28.5 million. We're talking real dollars producing another pressure on corporates to address the trafficking that's happening basically where their businesses are being used um, for by traffickers. Um, there, there's a there's more um, billion dollar businesses, but those two examples can just help you understand essentially it's it's companies that are under pressure to solve this pro problem, either from regulators or from the courtroom to say, oh, wow, I need a massively scalable solution. So it gives you a sense of the pain points that these companies are diving into and how it is, it's actually for-profit businesses that, that are building scalable solutions um, that can give you context as we dive in with these four entrepreneurs. So let's dive in. David, um, supply chain monitoring. We got of those 50 million, just to frame from, from my perspective, 26 million are labor trafficking victims working for big capitalism. How does Evidencity address this? Like, can you unpack for us how you, how you can help a company to address these risks in their supply chain? Sure. Just for, for context, if everybody thinks about globalization over the last 30, 40 years, um, our, our global economy has become tremendously interwoven, interdependent, and extremely complex. So if you just take like a, in the United States, a Fortune 50 company, uh, a publicly traded company, so you can go because of SEC filing and you can see how many vendors they have in their supply chain. And a, and a Fortune 50 company might have 100,000 or more uh, tier one suppliers that are working directly with that company. But then you start thinking about, well, how many suppliers does that 100,000 have? And then how many suppliers do they have? And as, as you start working out that, that kind of link analysis, you can see how overwhelming it, it becomes for one company to say, do I really understand my entire supply chain from, from um, as, as we like to say, like from dirt or from factory or from plantation all the way to consumer. It's um, the, the scale, the volume is just kind of mind boggling. And the way in which Evidency works is that we like to think of ourselves as a spotlight. We are a spotlight to look into the dark recesses of that complex global economy where nefarious and bad actors are hiding out, where they know they can hide out because it is so complex, because it is so large, um, because they know that, that that Fortune 50 company you know, has not in the past had the ability to dive into all of those areas and they create shell companies and, and little networks and everything, little syndicates that then allow them to siphon off legitimate global economy dollars for nefarious purposes. And in, in this case with anti-trafficking, actually for the purposes of exploiting and using human beings. And so what Evidencity does and what we've created is by using tech, as well as by using um, the idea of a gig economy, using people on an as needed basis, as, a, as opposed to using them as regular contractors or employees, that that, that is a scalable model, um, emphasizing technology, emphasizing the gig economy, and we're able to get that information out of those nooks and crannies of the global economy and actually get that all the way back up to that original company who, who's in control of that supply chain. And that information is incredibly powerful to those companies 
um, or those institutions, financial institutions, um, and that then allows them to start, you know, weeding these bad actors out. And and our ultimate goal is not just to weed them out because because then it becomes like a game of whack-a-mole, right? Bad actors say, oh, you closed down that shell company, I'll just pop pop one up over here. Maybe I already have popped up and, and we're back in business. Um, our idea is to is to actually not only identify them, but tag them to the global community so that they're never able to get back into the legitimate cycle. And that's that's what we're doing at Evidency West. That's super exciting. I know um, a story you had shared recently is you found 2,300 slaves, legitimate slaves in a leading tea brand's supply chain. How did you find them and how did you connect it to a brand that we all know and love? Sure. So, and and that's that's where our hybrid model is. We believe is so valuable. There's a there's a tremendous amount of great work happening in big data and the analytics that are going on big data, including um, machine learning and even now AI. Um, and that's all wonderful and that's all great. But in the emerging um, and edge markets of the global economy, big data and AI will only get you so far. And in that case what the key to solving that puzzle or that riddle was actually the bills of laden that were being written in the um the port that was exporting the material out to the global economy and and they are written in such scribble that um ocr technology actually can't get the information um can't scrape the information and so we actually had to be there in the port looking at those bills of laden to really understand what was going on it's super powerful the way you're um integrating big data with live people on the ground i just saw i was watching a recording of a a group that's trying to tackle some or problems they got about a billion dollars of of funding to tackle it and they talked about an example in brazil and how they could apply there and in my mind i knew all of Brazil's corporate records are on paper and that if they don't have uh, capabilities like Evidensity, they're never going to succeed. Um, so really appreciate the way you all are integrating big data with people. And, and I think that's in some ways, that's what we're seeing massive success at writ large is yeah. integration of AI and big data with people because um, those who think AI and big data can solve everything are generally running into, oh, people are actually still really valuable <laughs> and integrate. It's actually uh, AI enabled people that are changing the world right now. It's not just AI is a, is one of our theses, but thank you. That's super helpful to understand what Evidensity is doing. Um, Rochelle, nonprofit to for-profit, you've got, you've had 230,000, you not individually, but your organization has had 230,000 conversations with sex workers and that is amazing. Just, I mean, kudos for the incredible work you're doing, helping people who are ready and excited to come out of this work um, to um, to exit the the sex industry. Um, but you're you've got a ton of valuable data, and how does that drive revenue to to your nonprofit? Can you help us unpack that a little bit? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on this, and it is really exciting the data that we have and. We've only owned Freedom Signal, our organization that I founded in 2007, since 2022. So we're finding creative ways to um, continue adding data to our system and then looking for revenue streams. But a couple of the things that have been uh, we're looking at and exploring is we have these 200 and actually 80,000 conversations where oh, <laughs> the, no, it's okay. Like I just got the updated numbers uh, this week. So, but these conversations um, that we've been having include where these victims are at and they include what hotels, what street, what massage parlor locations. And you would be amazed at 280,000 conversations, all of the data that we can collect to be able to then assist in using that to fight human trafficking. So we're looking at ways to um, utilize that data. And, you know, we have about five years worth of data uh, of, of being able to map and see where these, these hot spots are. And so um, I think it's, you know, as we explore our nonprofit, a for-profit wing to be able to use the data to drive revenue and, in the anti-human trafficking space, it will only help fuel us to have more conversations. 
Um, so those 280,000 conversations have happened with about 120 advocates. Um, and so, you know, we, we have 3 million more people to get to in our system. And, uh, but, but being able to find a revenue stream that helps us continue to grow that side of our company will uh, help us uncover more and more exploited and trafficked victims. I love the this intersection of nonprofit and for profit and the opportunities to just create scalable solutions. Um, and it, it kind of blew me away. You showed me some texts that you all would get back sometimes when um, from um, um, when you've texted several girls at the same time and the trafficker will come back and self-identify as a cartel, say, I'm a cartel and I'm coming for you. Um, and the you think about like wow if you show a banker hey are you sh are you interested in knowing that your customer is self identifying as a as a cartel or a multi you you also talked about some multifamily owners that were using this to make sure um, that their customers weren't uh, were doing this I mean it just it blew me away like if if a banker knew that their customer was self identifying as a cartel and threatening to kill people. Um, they would, um, I don't know, it's just kind of incredibly lucid data to shine a light into what's happening here. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I think one of the things that's very unique about how our system was created is specifically we have location-based information. So when a, when a victim or a trafficker texts our system, which our system keeps our advocates safe and secure and anonymous, um, we have their exact location of where they're sending that from down to about, I'd say about a mile radius. And we can track, you know, when we engage those traffickers and um, when we've had conversations with them, which to be fair, that's not exactly what we do. We're looking at avenues to be able to use that particular data yes. uh, in the fight. It's a little fight. bit future but, looking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, it's, they're, they're even telling us exactly where they're at and where they're going to, you know, come and uh, get us for better, for, for <laughs> less words. They send uh, choice words. But, you know, I think one of the things that we're finding out with Freedom Signal is the way that it was created and just the nature of the business that we're, you know, the, the industry that we're fighting is when you try to reach victims, you will reach the traffickers. And mm -hmm. that will that that's what we're seeing in our system. That's what we want to figure out a way to uh, take that data, monetize it, ultimately to fuel reaching more victims. And um, so we're exploring what that looks like and and how can it's, we best it's use so that? So exciting. Yeah, in in the law enforcement applications, I, I feel excited yeah. about as well. I would love to um, yeah. have the, have somebody sitting on the stand explaining why did you self identify as a cartel and threaten to kill this person, um, yeah. and like, and them trying to say, well, well, that and just leave, leave them to defend that. Like that just seems like we live in a world where that's possible to to hold them accountable for what they're doing. Um, so. Yeah. Really appreciate what you're doing. Um, and just to voice as well on the nonprofit side, if people are watching this, um, if you're, um, especially I think you, you tend to partner with churches, right? If you have a church that might want to get involved and have a few people that wanted to um, to partner with you, how would they get a hold of you if there was a group of five at a church? So it was like, wow, being part of um, Scarlet Hope was really exciting. How would they get a hold of you? Yeah, I mean, we have a, for churches specifically, we have a huge di digital um, outreach program that they can be a part of. They can shoot me an email at hello at freedomsignal.org and we'll get them connected. But we also, not pro you know, we're working with nonprofits all across the nation and Canada to reach those victims. So they can also email us there and we'd be glad to plug them in. Nice. Noel. You have um, mapped 32,000 brothels run by 200 crime syndicates. And how did you turn this mapping data into a for-profit company? Uh, it's a great question, Wes. So organized crime is often operating in these illicit massage establishments. And these women are often promised a better job here in the United States. When they come over here, their passports are taken and they don't have the freedom of movement. 
And what we realize is that because there's a high concentration of these illicit businesses here in the U.S., they often bank with regional banks. And we found a solution to be able to sell that data to the banks where they could cross check against their accounts uh, and account holders to see if there was a match between this illicit activity. And what's really exciting is how these banks use this data uh, when they find those matches, they can file suspicious activity reports. They can even end the banking relationship. And that ties into our thesis of breaking the business of modern day slavery by making it impossible for them to conduct business. So we started out as a, as a data as a service. Um, and in this, this next growth round that we're going through, we're bringing a platform. You can kind of think of it as the operating system of the counter trafficking movement, where we can plug in a lot of different data sources that are piped directly into the native workflows of those banks. And so uh, we've been really excited to bring the, the first phase of this and the next phase, which is also empowered by AI. Um, and, and that's kind of the last piece here is, is that part of the reason that this organized crime exists is because there's a lot of antiquated and inefficient methods in identifying organized crime. Um, and what the AI is doing and, and the risk scoring algorithm that we're, we're bringing is it helps triage and identify these signals of organized crime so that banks can respond quicker and level up at the pace that organized crime is leveling up. That's amazing. You kind of taught me this thesis that if we think of um, these as these traffickers as entrepreneurs in the worst sense of the word, the idea that they run a business and they have a revenue line on one side, an expense line on the other, that if we can push down the, the revenue and push up the expense, if we can get those two to cross, that we literally decimate trafficking anywhere because anywhere that the it's more expensive to run than than the um, revenue line it, it ends the business um so I just really deeply appreciate that anything you would add to to that theory of change yeah absolutely so i think that we're at this point where a lot of businesses don't realize their risk exposure to human trafficking and uh, even in the past two years ago they would say hey this is not our problem. Uh, one dating platform went as far as to say that uh, prostitutes need love and prostitutes need love too. And we were showing them sex trafficking data. And that was the mindset of the market two or three years ago of like, this is not our problem, or this is a joke, or we can just check some minimum box and, and not have to deal with human trafficking. But the JP Morgan lawsuit um, the litigation that's coming down in multiple verticals and industries is showing, yes, you as a business are responsible uh, under a, a theory called constructive notice. The, the litigators use this to mean that you should know that this type of business is going on, even uh, if you don't think that it fits your purview or some businesses uh, that are directly responsible and know what's going on. And both of those have, have made 30 different industries, including the banks liable for human trafficking. And so to drive this theory of change, it's, it's helping businesses uh, realize that risk, that inherent risk that they have in their day-to-day -day operations, and then giving them the technology to quickly level up um, against traffickers. It is interesting that it really is a one-two punch between the courtrooms producing the pain, but then you coming in and, and other tech companies like you come in and say, and here's the solution. So if we get that combination of pain and ability to solve it in the same um, place, then we can see massively scalable change. So deeply appreciate what you're doing. Johnny Kessler, Deja Vu, you are actually seeing... Er, participating in helping live rescues happen. Can you explain how that's, um, how you're helping live rescues happening with pattern recognition? Sure. Um, so our technology, and I can show if you, when you're ready, Wes, I can just jump over to a live demonstration and show you what it means. Cause as we all have heard a million times in our lives, nice, I would love that so. picture is worth a thousand words. So what happens in the world um, is pictures are used in illicit ads and and so forth to draw people to you know buyers connect the the seller to the buyer and um what we can be used 
for the hotels and also for law enforcement as well is to identify the hotel before the exchange takes place. Or if the exchange is taking place over time, we can actually identify the location of the victim. And, um, you know, from the, we're not the experts in the the numbers of of exactly how many people there are, but a great portion of the people that are involved in illicit activities are coerced from something. So that's how we're getting involved is the people that are not or that are doing this unwillingly or being coerced into doing it. We're helping them be identified by law enforcement and by NGOs to say, we are here to help and, and, and draw them out of that. So I'll quickly turn on screen sharing and oh, host is disabled screen sharing. So I will wait till that's un enabled. But um, so how we're actually participating and being part of that is uh, for, and I have an example of uh, there was a uh, law enforcement agency that was looking for a uh, a young lady that was in a hotel room, and all they had was the 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 image from that illicit ad site. And so, what we took that ad, compared that to a database of short term rentals in the region where they suspected that she was in, we found a match in less than thirty seconds. And we were able to verify with humans to say, okay, this is where our AI actually did the pattern match of the the um, bedspread. That's what was the clue was was the bedspread in the image was matched to the bedspread from the from the short term rentals advertisement. And we we showed it to several law enforcement experts, and they said, yep, that's the place. Turn that over to law enforcement. Law enforcement had her rescued in a very short period of time, where otherwise that minor who was being trafficked would have been unidentified or they would have basically had to go to the old school knocking on doors until they found her. And most likely, as we know, those families of trafficker victims move from place to place, and they are doing that constantly to stay ahead of law enforcement. And so by doing this, we were able to get one step ahead of them because they thought they wouldn't be caught. They're like, their, their idea is, okay, we'll tear down and we'll, we'll move the family to a new place in, in, in two days. That's what we're going to do. But we had this victim identified what, right after the ad went up. So that's, that's what we use our pattern recognition to do for um, this case. And in this case, family means the group of victims that's being sold, right? Correct. Um, the, um, so... How could that scale, um, Rochelle? How many how many ads would be would do you all see on a given night? Um, well, we have scraped twenty two million ads. That's giving us unique victim information. Uh, we have about three million of those victims that are unique. So uh, we've done some data work on how many one individual posts forty two ads on average a day. So, you know, our system is, is identifying all of those and then giving us that victim one time to be able to communicate with. So uh, on a given night, I don't know how many we're scraping, a, a few thousand, but yeah. it collects data every night and, or adds every night and then yeah. uh, aggregates it down into our system. Yeah. That's powerful data sets. So Johnny, if we look at like, millions, uh, a few million victims that are, or, or potential victims in the, in the data pool. Is it possible to think of actually seeing like a massively scalable locating effort happening here? Absolutely. So again, putting that in the hands of law enforcement and then subsequently, once law enforcement identifies the victims, getting that information to the NGOs and support organizations so they know who they're dealing with and know. And, the, and another thing that we've seen them uh, this uh, assist with is identifying all of those people that are within the family, the, the, the victims and the uh, trafficker, we can package those together. So, and this actually was another uh, rescue uh, that we were, part of and again that's we're part of the solution there I, all four of us here are part of the solution to to take the fight to where it needs to be but we take that data 
that links them together and then can provide that so that law enforcement knows this group of six is traveling together. That actually, again, another event was they knew one. And when one showed up and posted a picture at a hotel, we were able to identify the hotel. That person was not underage. So it wasn't, they weren't moving as quickly, but they said, we know that two of the pe persons in this family are underage. Then they actually started watching that hotel closely for ads to pop up again. Ads popped up again, handed it over, hand that handed the package to law enforcement and said, you've got two victims that are underage minors that are being trafficked right here. We're 90% confident they're right there. You can do your own research. And they did their research and say, yep, they're there. And they went and rescued two more. But again, that's how we're part of the solution is we identify the location with data that wasn't possible before. That reminds me of, um, Rochelle, you shared that you all sometimes are watching these families of, um, of victims actually just move across the country because one of their primary defense mechanisms is to not stay put and that you all kind of internally into your system flag high, much higher likelihood that these people are being trafficked when they show up in just they're moving state by state every few days. Mm -hmm. um, can you expound on that a little bit from the data you all are seeing? Yeah, so when we, um, when we are scraping the ads, we're gathering, you know, if that one victim posted 20 times, we are still gathering that data on all of the ads that were posted under that one victim. So when we look at, when we text, you know, mass text victim, potential victims, when they start texting in, we can see the trail of where those ads were placed in what city. So this is a good example. Yesterday, we sent a, several campaigns across the nation. And one of the women that responded had about 15 ads posted the same day across from New York to LA. So we, we have learned and we train our advocates and the people responding to these messages that that is a very good indication that that could definitely be a high end escort, um, you know, that's willing to fly anywhere for the right price. But it more than likely is a trafficking victim being sold from city to city on a daily basis. So um, at that point, we also will work with law enforcement and we'll carry on conversations to be able to get more information from the potential victim to be able to help them. Well, it's powerful and it's real. Um, real conversations with real people happening here live. I so appreciate what you're doing. Um, Noel, you've been involved in this kind of zooming out and the this theory that's developing that hotels are under a lot of fire, but... Um, but they're probably not going to piecemeal find Rochelle, find Johnny, find uh, find Noel and the in the couple other amazing tech um, in this movement and put it together themselves. And the group that's coming together and saying we can build an operations center that could pull it all into one solution for hospitality. Um, what's exciting about that to you? Can you expound on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Having kind of one. A uh, centralized system that's working with hospitality allows for information sharing, for training to level up in kind of a tactical look at the traffickers that are using these these hotels. And uh, there's a lot of ways to think about the risk that's inherent to the hotels. You have um, the customers that are staying themselves, but you also have the staff that might be involved in trafficking. Uh, I had the opportunity of going out on a raid in, in a past life working on the government side. And when we got to the hotel, the front desk had tipped off the trafficker that a raid was going down. And so when we got to the room, um, they were gone. And what's exciting about this operations center is that it takes a 360 view of a hotel, both their staff, um, the stays, the, the data that's provided in the advertising data, and it gives actionable insights of how to best respond to each scenario of trafficking so that the hotel can be best protected against traffickers, uh, maybe either knowingly or unknowingly using their, their hotel chain. 
Yeah, it's super powerful because I think, um, and one of the the theories that that we'll get to test is that often an employee, like you get hammered in the courtroom if your employees were bought off and involved and you didn't stop it. And, um, but there's almost always good people around them that don't know what to do, if that makes sense. And the ability to also put, like create an app that's in everybody's hands that they can silently be like, hey, somebody was just pulled into a room by their hair. Um, something something seems wrong. They know they can't go to their boss because their boss seems to be waving these people by. Um, if they're able to drop that info into, into an app, it goes into an operation center with the 360 view. And that's the clue that puts it like, all right, let's roll or let's get this warrant package into law enforcement hand. Cause so often that's actually about partnering with um, their, their people who are professionals at um, rolling in as a SWAT team and dealing with the the issue. This isn't for vigilantes to to do, but it's also, hey, this is capitalism got us into the problem. Capitalism needs to get us out of it as well, uh, which is exciting. I really appreciate your your role in it. Was it? Did you want to add to that, Noel? That well, I wanted to also say, you know, we typically think of the hotels from the sex trafficking angle, but there's also a place for counter labor trafficking and supply chain. Uh, solutions because uh, there's a huge influx of labor trafficking that occurs in in the cleaning staff and some of the behind the scenes staff so vetting that but also you think about the sheets and the pillows and the pillowcases and the, and the curtains right that may have uh, labor in the supply chain as well and so they may unknowingly be sourcing materials um, for the hotel rooms that were were slave made, and uh... that's a great dovetail into the labor trafficking side of this. Um, and I personally, just a few weeks ago, had a story that just made me realize how this came into into my life in a much more personal way. Where our neighbor's been walking with a young man who had a DUI and just hiring him on the weekends, trying to help him walk back into a flourishing life. And we've been uh, we kind of. Uh, I've been hiring him as well to just try to try to serve in a, in a small way to be part of this young man's life. And a few weeks ago, he didn't show up. And my neighbor had a phone conversation with him and he was in prison. And as she pulled the story out of him, um, he had been um, he had been working for two dollars an hour for his employer who was holding his parole visit, uh, his parole meetings over his head to extort him into labor trafficking. It was happening right in front of my face um, that this young man that we were trying to help was being extorted into labor trafficking in like, he's literally in my yard. Um, we weren't paying him $2 an hour. We were paying him a great wage to try to be helpful. But on the weekdays he was getting extorted and they had actually held his parole meeting back um, and actually kind of pull, um, called his bluff on, on truly a, the extortion. So now he's back. He was back in prison for a little while, and it just kind of blew me away how right in front of us labor trafficking is. Um, and maybe um, David, if you can just ex expound on what are you most excited about? Like why? Why is there actual hope that twenty six million people we can start actually seeing this um, this addressed? In, in like, what gets you excited as you look at look forward? Sure, and and like to to your personal uh, example right there, um, what gets me what gets me most excited has also been over the last few years what's frustrated me the most because I I often feel that that my my biggest or our biggest kind con of uh, competition and evidentiality is apathy, and and I don't I don't mean that in a judgmental or a negative way. Um, I think there's there's apathy. We've all had apathy. Many, many of the viewers uh, might know uh, Sharon Prince at uh, Grace Farms and Design for Freedom. And she uh, kind of just really put an idea in, in my head that I had never thought of before, but she calls it the, um, the slave discount, that we've all gotten very, very used to the slave discount. We expect our, our phones to be a certain price, our cars to be a certain price, our food to be a certain price, and and... And we've all been a little bit like asleep and apathetic. And, that, and that's been very frustrating. What I'm excited about is that I feel like the tide is turning. 
I feel like just in the last couple of years, more people are talking about this, more people are aware of this. There's more discussion at the political level and the regulatory level. There's more discussion in the um, in the consumer world. Um, many of the viewers might have seen about two months ago, uh, Saturday Night Live did a did a spoof commercial about fast fashion and and it's tied to slave labor in asia and i was like whoa it's like it's it's starting to break through and we're all coming mainstream up. yeah yeah we're all starting to wake up from this like this apathy this this oh well you know that's just the slave discount so um i'm hopeful and excited that more and more people are becoming aware more and more people are 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 um uh, are aware of this and and now we're going to start doing it and that tied with the whole idea of, of bringing capitalism and capital to bear against it gives me great hope that that you know we can actually not only turn the tide but start decimating it if i could ask it is that. really ex yeah go ahead um, yeah. so david along that line this is a personal story along like with what wes experienced um literally five miles from my home there was a farm being run by people that were being trafficked in from a South American country, and they were producing uh, vegetables and fruit being sold to local food stands and even some of the major chains as local food. And that price, everybody demands, I want fresh vegetables. I want fresh fruit. And it was coming from these people that five miles from my home was being produced. We have no idea. And so that supply chain of knowing who's doing that is very important for especially for those major brands and even the local ones nobody wants to be part of that they just didn't know they were part of it because all they were getting was a truck showing up with fresh produce yep. so it's so powerful because uh, what the with the regulators and the and the saturday night live moments and the videos and all the all the pressure is producing is this kind of spark of like oh it really is actually a spark of fear in most people, either a consumer or a business's head where they go, oh no, is are my suppliers doing that? And when you would when you all are able to produce an easy button that says, Oh, I'm I'm wondering if I'm part of this. Am I gonna be on the front page of the local newspaper that Whole Foods was buying from um from this um slave powered um farm or am i is my am i about to be hit with a with something is that in my supply chain to be able to have easy buttons where where they know oh i'm scared of that i can solve it call up david um it is it is what actually what capitalism is good at if that makes sense is yeah. producing easy buttons to solve problems yeah. and uh and so deeply appreciate that you all are doing that um and it's, it's just a big part of like when the courtrooms win, they need that pain needs to turn to solutions. If that may, I love, I've actually hated the court, like kind of the litigious elements of our society my whole life. Cause all I hear is the worst elements of litigation, if that makes sense. And for the first time in my life, I'm cheering like, Oh, this is why litigation exists. <laughs> because if you turn your blind eye and go, oh, I'm not really concerned that I'm getting a uh, sex ad or revenue on child exploitation material. Um, then you should be held held accountable. Or if you're like, ah, I bet I could stop trafficking in my hotel brand, but I don't really care enough to, that might hurt my revenue. That's exactly what litigation is meant for. And to have that pain being brought by the courts and you all bringing easy button, I mean, easy might be an overstatement, but very clear buttons. So here's the button to press. I can solve it is such a big deal. Um, what to... Uh, Rochelle, as you look forward, what what gives you hope as you look forward? I mean, I would be amiss to say that the faces that we know, the women that we've served, the families, the children, that's what gives me hope is that, you know, we're, we're sending thousands of text messages, but one woman at a time is, is finding freedom. And it, that's what really gives me hope, but also hope in the technology and hope in the space is finally, I feel like since meeting you, Wes, and meeting some other people, especially on this, this call, like there are solutions that are coming together because not one entity can fight this alone. So really the hope is in the numbers and us all coming together to put all of the pieces together that will, you know, make a major impact in the fight against human trafficking. That's so hopeful to me. 
I'm glad you, it, if there's so much to be said, if you, you read Malcolm Gladwell's work on like kind of where things really, really shift, they, they identified this idea that though things that really changed the world ultimately had people's, there were lists, people's names on it. Uh, mm -hmm. They had really designed for real people, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, we're always, it's a good to remember, like, if what we're building doesn't underlying actually have a real people mm -hmm. that are designed in the image of God, like, and their names at it, then we probably have a broken theory of change. If that makes sense. You know, so yeah. I really appreciate that. Um, Johnny, what gives you hope as you look forward? What gives me hope is actually where you and I spent some time this week together. Um, groups that are coming together that are finding tech solutions and and also legal solutions. Uh, basically, the the lawmakers are finally going, "Oh, we have we have a problem," and it's like, "Yeah, it's been burning out of control." But yeah, you have a problem, and we're here to help solve that. And what gives me hope is people that have the drive, like these others that I'm here with today. That, that we want to do something. We're doing something, not just sitting back and saying, gee, I wish somebody could do something. We're saying, let's get to it. Let's get this done. And it also saying certain things that are being said that are waking people up. Um, one of our, uh, a hero of mine, I think others here, he's a hero of his as well, um, William Wilberforce. He said, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say, again, that you didn't know. So we've got to get that in front of people so they know you've, you've got to, we've got to solve this as humans, as people made in God's image and people caring for people around us and not just directly around us, but in our communities and in our nation and in our world. That's super exciting. Can't say it better. <laughs> David, I think uh, you got a chance to say what you, was there, did you feel like you got to share um, what you're most excited about? The yeah, I, I, I think the, like everything's coming together. It's a perfect storm, right? There's the, there, there's starting to be the political will. There's, there's starting to be an awareness among, it's in the zeitgeist. Um, the tech is there. The solutions are there. Um, the capital is there. Like, it's a perfect storm to actually start beating back this tide. And I'm I like, it's a great, it's a great time. It's a great time to be alive. That's a well said. Noel, bring us home. What are you excited about when you look forward? Well, I, I could say that we're using the wheels of capitalism to grind out modern day slavery or that we're using uh, human in the loop AI and, and amazing technology to transform the fight on the front lines of human trafficking. But I think the thing that I'm most excited for is the change of heart of men and corporations. And what I mean by this is seeing a trafficker uh, come to the saving grace of God and then turning his operation into a recovery center for addicts and becoming uh, a preacher and, uh, and seeing the heart of these corporations, which were once hard and saying, hey, this is not our problem. We're looking the other way. Uh, we've got no involvement to being moved to now finding solutions and building departments around this. And so uh, the thing that I'm most excited about is is the change of heart in this issue. It is amazing to see people change and just want to honor the the power of that witness that I stand with you. I'm watching people change and it's powerful. Well, Thank you all for joining us for this session. We really appreciate you allocating some of your time. Hopefully you're walking away with a little bit more hope that we really can see human trafficking decimated in our lifetime. We're excited and want you to share our hope. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you. you, Wes. Thank you, Wes.